So I'm sure everybody had a busy day and is ready to wind down a little bit. So this is probably good for everyone. Uh, welcome to my session, Into the Next Dimension. Uh, my name is Ed Charbonneau. I am a software developer advocate for a company called Progress. I specialize primarily in a product of ours called Telerik DevCraft. Uh, if you've been doing any uh, .NET develop, development for uh, any amount of time, you've probably heard of Telerik before. Um, we've rebranded uh, as Progress now, and uh, we have some more products that came on board as part of that and some uh, name changes. But we're still the uh, same company that builds amazing UIs for uh, not only .NET, but web interfaces and uh, uh, mobile as well, so ASP.NET, um, uh, Windows Phone, Android, iOS, you name it, we have uh, awesome UI suites for those. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP, an author, I'm working on ASP.NET Core book right now. I write for uh, the Telerik Developer Network, which is a blog of our own. Um, I also do a podcast for Telerik called Eat Sleep Code. Uh, the, the podcast itself isn't focused on our products, but developers, so if you're not interested in the Teller products, then it, it's still a good listen because I interview developers from all over and uh, let them talk about what they're interested in. Um, and if you want to interact with me, I'm always on Twitter uh, by my name, Ed Charbonneau. Uh, just send me a tweet and uh, I'll get back to you right away. I'm always on there talking with folks. <laughs> So I hope you enjoy this presentation. It's a bit of a fun presentation. Um, I'm a little bit of a history nerd. Um, I love technology and I love like things about the future and stuff like that. So this is kind of a culmination of those three things. And uh, there's kind of a story that, that brings us all together. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's a good way to wind down your day. <laughs> Um, so, as a vehicle for this talk, I'm going to be using the Twilight Zone. So, has anybody in this room not seen the Twilight Zone? Okay, awesome. Depending on the crowd, like, this is a very mixed bag. <laughs> so, I've had almost nobody, and then almost everybody, and here is great. So, you'll understand where this is coming from. So, to kick things off, you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of data. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. So why did I choose the Twilight Zone to take us through this talk? The Twilight Zone often dealt with technology. Okay, so it was a frequent topic on the show. Uh, in this case, uh, the photo up here shows uh, an android with uh, its face ripped off. And uh, I remember this episode pretty well. Uh, this guy was exiled to another planet, and uh, he was completely alone. Um, and he was wrongfully accused of a crime, uh, and the warden felt bad for him, so he gave him an android to keep him company. And uh, at the end of the show, he was trying to make the decision of, should I stay with my android friend, or should I go home at, after being acquitted of the crimes? So the common theme of the show was sometimes technology, but the real theme of the show itself wasn't technology at all. It was the human condition. So I'm going to talk about how technology plays into the human condition and uh, how it's affecting us and what the future is going to be like. And from my point of view, there's three technologies that will help shape this future. And it's up to us to kind of figure out how we're going to react to that. And a, a second reason I chose the Twilight Zone is because it's a reference to the past. <laughs> And it was from an interesting age. Uh, it was the atomic age. And this is back when the future really looked futuristic. Like, I don't know if you've ever gone and watched like old science fiction films, but this was an age of like fins on cars and just everything looked cool and futuristic back then. 
Uh, so it's a good, a good way to set us back in that time zone. So we're going to start with big data. That's going to be the first technology we'll talk about. And big data, if you're not familiar, is uh, the, the use of extremely large data set. And we use this data to analyze patterns in, of course, human behaviors and interactions. And we're going to go to uh, 1961, which is within that time frame of when the Twilight Zone uh, was on the air. And let's look at data storage in 1961. So um, I wasn't around to remember this, but uh, hard disk drives were 52 inches tall, 70 inches wide, uh, total capacity 205 meg. <laughs> Uh, so this is roughly, in today's dollars, $3.6 million per gigabyte, okay? So even though I wasn't around in 1961, this is not a really long time ago, okay? This is really, in the grand scheme of things, a very short time ago. Uh, let's fast forward a little bit to today and look at data storage. 16 terabytes in two and a half inches of space. Uh, the price per, gig per gigabyte is lower than three cents per gigabyte now. So th that's a great deal of change in roughly 60 years uh, for a technology to transform. And the more space that we have available, the more space that we fill up. So this is a human condition where if we have an empty space, we have this need to fill that empty space. Like people do this with other things as well. Like you can, you'll see people's houses, they try to fill those empty spaces. You know, pictures go on walls. Uh, we, ha we have this need to fill things up. And we're doing this at an exponential rate. So uh, you can see up here that uh, more than 90% of the data in the globe was generated over the course of the past two years. So most of the data that exists came about in a very short period of time. And the total amount of volume of data that the industry captures doubles every 1.2 years. So this is just taking off like a giant hockey stick, like this is exponential. So knowing that, we can kind of fast forward a little bit and predict what uh, the future of storage might look like and the future of big data might look like. And uh, it's theorized that um, there will be over 40 zettabytes stored by 2020. So to try to put this in perspective, uh, that's equivalent to 125 million years of one hour <laughs> uh, episodes of the Twilight Zone. So if you sat there and watched them end to end, it would take one, uh, 125 million years to get through all of the video. So why are we doing this? Like what's, what's the goal of storing all of this data? Why, why is it necessary for us to do it? And what can we use it for? So I'm going to go back even further in the time machine. To 1854. In 1854, an event happened that changed the game. Uh, this is a gentleman by the name of John Snow. Uh, he's regarded as the founding father of epidemiology. And he used data to change the way that we look at health and disease and patterns that caused outbreaks. So back in 1854, uh, people believed that the smell in the air was what made you sick and ended up killing you. And Jon Snow had a feeling that this was not the correct theory and he needed to support that evidence somehow. So this was called the bad air theory, that bad air from decomposing uh, flesh and waste caused the sickness. And John 
use statistics to illustrate how this didn't support his theory. So what he did is he, he got a map of the city uh, during the outbreak. He walked around, knocked on doors, and asked how many people had passed from disease. And when they told him a number, he would plot dots or little bars on his, his map. And as he kept doing this, he noticed that the bars grew greater around a water pump. And then when he visited a brewery down the street, there were absolutely no problems whatsoever because the people that worked at the brewery didn't drink water, they drank beer. The beer was distilled, which boiled all the germs out of the water, so they weren't exposed to the cholera, so they didn't have any problems. So this helped support his theory that the bad smells weren't the problem, but the water was the problem. So he didn't know exactly what was in the water that was hurting people, but he knew it wasn't the air, it was the water. So what will we do with data in the future? We saw what John Snow did in 1854, uh, and here's what we're doing today. So Harvard researchers are uh, looking into uh, cell phone records. They took 15 million users, and they're able to track patterns of disease being spread. And one of the diseases they're tracking is cholera. So this age-old problem still exists in parts of the world, and Harvard researchers are using cell phones in developing countries as a mechanism for trying to figure out where outbreaks will happen next. And they're going to they're gonna use this and put it into a forecasting model for uh, medical uh, people to use and access throughout the medical community. And there's a lot of different points of data besides cell phones that could be used for things like this. So we have wearables. You know, these are things that are on people's bodies and tracking things. Uh, some of them um, can track body temperature. So if people are getting fevers, that's data that would be collected. Uh, Nest thermostats have data, and they track data. Uh, if you're sick, you may, you know, change the temperature in your living space. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can add to this. And... As we go into the future, these things increase in accuracy, and by doing that, they increase the forecasting ability. So what's the human condition with big data? So one of the big things is, when is it socially acceptable to use our data, and what happens when we allow people to access it? So even though people fear things like getting sick, they also fear things like being quarantined. So there's kind of a fine line there that people want. They want the benefit of the technology, but they don't want the downside. So moving forward, how do we make sense of all this data? Remember I said 125 million years of video is about the capacity that we're storing. And that brings me to the next technology I want to talk about, and that is machine learning. This is something you've probably heard more and more about, uh, being talked about at conferences and uh, reading about in blogs and journals. And artificial intelligence is actually uh, the term that we used to use for this. And this term got pretty broad. So artificial intelligence is a more broader definition of uh, things that you that we normally require human intelligence to do, and these things include visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translating between languages. And just like the data science, um, these AI technologies started in the 1950s as well. So in the 1950s, AI research began. Alan Turing proposed the Turing test. So this was like a basic test to uh, quantify a computer's uh, human-like intelligence. 
And then in 1956, there was a Dartmouth conference. This is considered the birth of AI. Uh, there was a lot of scientists that got into one room together and kind of did like an incubator type of thing, and they came up with all of these ideas and algorithms that uh, we even use today. Um, and we came up, they came up with things like reasoning as search, natural language, micro worlds. Um, natural language you might use today in things like uh, Siri. Um, Microworlds uh, is something like uh, what the Kinect uses to kind of find its way around a room or, or examine a room in 3D space. So these are all things that actually came out of the 50s. And it's really interesting because these were times where people had really big ideas, right? Um, this was when uh, we started op opening the first nuclear power plants. So we we harnessed the atom. Um, the Soviets landed an unmanned spacecraft on the moon, starting a space race. So there were these really big ideas, uh, things that were once science fiction, were starting to become reality. And for decades, we we worked on these AI things, and uh, the problem was that. The, the imagination and the, the expertise of the, the people that worked on them uh, weren't any less than they are today, but they just didn't have the computing power or the storage capacity to make use of it. So what ended up happening is they did a lot of uh, smaller things like solve, uh, like checker and chess games and things like that. So their ideas... Uh, were surpassed by the capabilities to execute. And sometimes big ideas need time for science to catch up before they can be a reality. So this is a, an old comic. This is Dick Tracy, and uh, you can see he's talking to his, his watch. Um, so back then, that was absolute science fiction. Today, not so much. So this is something that eventually became reality. So let's look a little bit at today. And today we're using a subset of AI called machine learning. And the, the real thing that makes machine learning uh, important is that it uses algorithms uh, to make predictions based on data. So remember all of that data that would take a person forever to analyze, uh, we're now using machine learning to analyze that data and do the predictions for us. So real quick, before we get too far, I just want to disambiguate this notion that artificial intelligence is this like sentient thing that uh, can kind of conquer us all, like science fiction has showed us before with the Terminator. And it's really not, it's uh, the, the term that is usually confused with artificial intelligence is artificial general, or yeah, artificial general intelligence. That's the autonomous thinking, uh, conquer the world, eliminate the human race thing that people fear, not AI. AI is the, uh, the thing I talked about earlier, you know, vision, speech to text, and stuff like that and machine learning is in that as well. So we shouldn't really fear artificial intelligence. Uh, AGI, or artificial general intelligence, is pretty far in the future. Uh, but with that said, the human condition still applies. Um, I wouldn't worry as much about uh, some artificial intelligent being taking over as, I, as much as I would uh, the humans and how they use the technology that we have existing today. So here's some of the machine learning uses in uh, Progress Digital Factory is a product that is made by the company that I work for, Progress Software. And Progress Digital Factory is part of a solution of tools that includes Sitefinity content management system and our digital experience cloud. And uh, this uses predictive analytics to help users uh, get engaged with content 
and serves them the content that is relative to their needs. All of the big companies, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and so on, have some machine learning uh, in their software. Uh, these are things like Siri, Cortana, Google Now. Uh, those use many aspects of machine learning, like voice recognition and uh, being able to search by co the context of what uh, you gave it. Um, there's a lot of things going on under the hood, and there's even very trivial things that these companies do and use machine learning that you wouldn't normally expect uh, an application of that um, small of a subset to be using machine learning. For example, the Microsoft Windows Phone keyboard uh, has been tweaked using machine learning. So they, they were collecting user data on spelling errors, and based on those spelling errors, uh, they were able to predict when you're going to misspell a word. So they would set the hit size of the key that you were going to miss, uh, that you needed to hit uh, larger, so you didn't accidentally hit the key that was next to it on the keyboard. So if, you're, if there's machine learning going into something as simple as a keyboard, uh, I can guarantee you that these big companies are using it in many other aspects of their software. So if you're building software now and you haven't started looking into machine learning, it might be time. Um, the people that are the companies and folks that get on board with machine learning now are going to be much further ahead of the folks that don't. So this is going to be, in my opinion, similar to when the iPhone launched and everybody tried to catch up. And uh, they had to play catch up for quite a while. And, some of them didn't make it. So we're using machine learning and, and big data today to make predictions based on data. And like I said, it's time for developers to look into this stuff. They've released machine learning to the masses now. Um, Azure has uh, quite a robust platform for machine learning that's accessible to uh, developers through a GUI system. Um, Amazon has machine learning available as well, and Google uh, has open sourced theirs. So these are all things that have made, been made develop, developer friendly. You don't have to be a data scientist to understand how they work. And then the human condition comes about. So there's been some misses with machine learning. Uh, this is an interesting one I wanted to talk about. This is where Target figured out, this is an actual headline that I put up here. Target figured out a teen girl was pregnant before her father did. This is an actual headline from an article I read. Uh, again, unintended consequences is a human condition. Uh, we, we're creepy when we do stuff like this. And what had happened is Target was using machine learning and tracking people's purchasing habits and because of those purchasing habits, or the things that you buy or stop buying, uh, they can tell that somebody may be pregnant. So what they did is they started sending her physical mail with advertisements for baby stuff. So dad goes to the mailbox, pulls out the ads, and gets mad calls Target and says, please stop sending my teenage daughter these ads for baby stuff. You're going to give her the wrong idea and think it's okay to have a baby. And they said, we're sorry, but it's probably too late. <laughs> Turns out they were right. <laughs> Doesn't make them any less creepy. So uh, dad was let down slowly and... Um, Target changed their practices somewhat. Uh, from what I understand, they, they just kind of obfuscate the uh, mail with additional stuff. So you'll still get the baby mail, but you'll also get, like, I don't know, like windshield wiper ads or something to cover it up. So that, that's what I understand of the, the resolution on that. Um, and then with great power comes great responsibility, right? Uh, remember I said don't worry about the Terminator coming to get you. I think uh, we're kind of doomed before that. Um, the Def Department of Defense is interested in a company that is uh, trying to use artificial intelligence or, or machine learning to model when 
um, terror groups or militant groups are going to attack somewhere. Uh, God forbid they arm drones or something and let them fire autonomously. Um, like I said, these aren't smart machines. They're not AGI machines. They're machine learning machines that can make simple mistakes if you feed them the wrong data. So, like I said, we, we have to get to AGI before we can worry about AGI. Uh, we, we may have bigger fish to fry. So what does the future hold for AI technologies? Uh, with much more data, these things become much more useful and accurate. Uh, we're collecting data on all sorts of things these days. Uh, how many people have a wearable in the room? Got yeah, a little more than half. Uh, depends on what conference you're at. It's usually a, a pretty high number. Um, we have GPS data, I mentioned thermostat data, uh, the Kinect captures 3D video. I don't know how long they hold on to it, but it's uh, very uh, reasonable to think that we could capture that indefinitely pretty soon. Um, your search history, your Twitter history, uh, and the scope of data is starting to get wider. Um, I saw a uh, changing table that had IoT features where it would tell how heavy your baby is when you put it on the table to change it, and then it would let you know if the baby is losing or gaining weight, um, so it could alert you to medical problems early. So we're capturing data from, from that small of an age, uh, and it's getting to every aspect of our life, um, and we're collecting data that we have no use for today, but could possibly have a use for tomorrow. Question. Yes. A lot of these companies are collecting the data. And my impression is the data is not being connected uh, between the companies behind the scenes or cross analysis. So while my wearable may have my step patterns and my sleep patterns, that may not be connected with my buying habits. Okay, so the the question or statement is rather um, that you know your your Kroger uh, shopping card may not be connected to your Fitbit uh, data and cross referenced and so on. Um, my point of view would be give it time. <laughs> uh, we know for a fact that cell phone companies do share our data with other companies. Uh, usually that's where the money is made and um, at the lunch keynote today that, that point was brought up as well that uh, Uber has a boatload of data that is worth more than uh, the, well, I think it was the Ford Motor Company as a whole. So. Uh, I, I would say give it time. Um, the more that people find uses for it, uh, the more it will be worth uh, to larger companies, and they will pay for it, and they will cross-reference it. Um, and that kind of segues into what I was talking about, too. So what happens when we start making sense of the data? It's all in license. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is all in your uh, terms and conditions, which um, some of some of the data in this uh, presentation is is actually um, uh, things that I learned from a um, a good documentary called Terms and Conditions May Apply. So if you think that some of this is interesting, that's a good uh, film to watch. Um, they do a good job at outlining uh, some of the stuff. And actually, that that is uh, one of the points here on this slide of uh, anonymous data. So a lot of the data they collect that you were talking about is deemed as anonymous data. So they, the companies claim that, um, you know, this isn't, going to be tracked back to you, they're not going to take your search habits and uh, go back and you know point down to one person and say, this was Joe's search habits, um, they're saying this is anonymous data, you can't track it back. So in the documentary what they did is they sent a private investigator armed with Google, or sorry, Yahoo's anonymous data and he was able to go back and physically find people <laughs> and uh, by their search habits. 
So uh, in that example, he went through and found a person that was searching things like, how do I murder my wife, how to bury a body, uh, all these really doom and gloom things about killing someone. Uh, and when he went to the guy's house, it turned out he was a writer for CSI, the TV show. <laughs> so you can see where missed predictions can happen. When I was saying those things, I know most of you, including myself, were thinking this guy's going to kill his wife. <laughs> Turns out he was completely not doing that. Um, his, his wife actually came on camera and was like, I'm here, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a fun uh, documentary in that respect to, to watch what they did. But that uh, leads me to, to this point where if a person or private investiga investigator can reverse engineer anonymous data, sounds like a job for machine learning to me, uh, where you could possibly do that instantaneously uh, based on what inputs you have and what type of machine learning you have available. So this gives us a line that has to be crossed. This is a, another human condition here, where does the benefit of what the results of this machine learning and data, uh, do they overweigh the need for privacy? So if I'm going to know uh, I can predict some bad health problem before it happens, is it OK to share my uh, eating habits, exercise habits, um, you know, health status with some company uh, and hope they use it for good and not look at how many cheeseburgers I've eaten and send that to uh, my health insurance company to deny me a claim. Mm -hmm. So it's a fine line and uh, it's something that we're all going to have to get used to. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to have to give up some of our privacy in favor of benefit. <laughs> so that brings me to augmented reality. So we have the data. We have uh, the ability to make predictions on that data. Um, I'm a web developer, so some of this kind of struck me as a familiar pattern. Um, so we have this thing called model view controller in web development. So when I look at big data, I think model. Um, when I see machine learning, I think controller. And then augmented reality would be view. So very, very familiar pattern here uh, for developers, uh, at least in my opinion. So what is augmented reality? Um, this is where we use computers to um, add things to the real world environment. So a lot of the examples I'll go through are visual ones. Um, just keep in the back of your mind that they don't have to be visual augmentations. These can be sound and other uh, modes of uh, augmenting somebody's um, real space. And these technologies started once again in the 1950s, back when that nice television show The Twilight Zone was around, uh, the world's first heads-up display came into operational service. So this was a very light uh, definition of an augmented reality. So we were using a computer to draw um, some simple vector lines on a display that was in front of a pilot. And um, when this was presented uh, to the folks in charge, they thought it was a ridiculous idea, and they had no use for it. Turns out it was actually a pretty big deal. Everybody in here has probably seen Top Gun. Uh, we know how it all, it all played out. Um, so that was 1958. The next things I'm going to talk about are considered by me yesterday. Okay, So we were kind of playing with the timeline a little bit here, because this stuff is like accelerating so fast um, that it's hard to, to really grasp like certain dates. Like this is like very recent, but it's moving so quickly it feels really old. Uh, so Google Glass. Again, the heads up display. Um, many people argue whether it's a success or a failure. Um, in my opinion, it was an experiment that brought about some uh, very relevant data uh, and kind of got, we got an understanding of 
uh, what some of the human conditions from this were. Uh, one of the things was privacy. You're walking around with a camera strapped to your face. That camera is going with you in your bedroom, in your bathroom, everywhere you're, you're, you are, there's a potential for video recording. People don't seem to like that very much. Um, data is being collected everywhere you are. Uh, and this is a, another one that you'll see uh, throughout the augmented reality slides here is uh, it's socially awkward, right? So people see you with something strapped on your face that they don't normally see you with, and uh, it kind of looks weird. Again, with yesterday stuff, um, <clears throat> Mobile powered AR. Uh, this is where your camera on your phone uh, provides an input and a live image, and uh, the sensors and data are used to overlay some information on your screen. So this was a neat app uh, that I have a picture of up here. It was Nokia City View or something like that. Uh, it was on the Microsoft phones. Um, and you could hold up your phone on a city street, and it would pull these little flags up and show you where. Um, a restaurant or something is that you might be looking for. It was it was a decent implementation. It was kind of cool, not very useful. Uh, a lot of times you found yourself holding the phone up and only having the flag that's on it like overlay on top of the actual signage and um, kind of block your view of finding what you're actually looking for. So it was a little bit of a miss. But even though it's a complete miss and it's it's not useful in so many ways. Uh, it's something that if you told, told somebody about it just five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, they'd think it was complete science fiction that you have this little candy bar sized thing in your hand and you're walking around and it's overlaying things on top of the, the image that you're uh, seeing in real time. So that I'm trying to put in perspective like that, you know, 1958 to now isn't that long of a uh, gap in time to come from just some simple vector drawings over um, your heads up display to this complex device with multiple core processors and cameras and the ability to compute these things and put them into real 3D space using GPSs and uh, that's a lot of technology to come together in such a short period of time. So today we have augmented reality that's uh, amped up a bit. Uh, this is one of the coolest examples um, that I've seen. Uh, this is called Google Translate. This is something you can get on your uh, phone right now. Um, it's free. It's a Google app. If you go visit another country, you can hold your phone up and in real time, this app will not only translate the language, but it will overlay it in such a way that it looks like it's part of the original signage. So there's several uh, machine learning capabilities being used there. You've got speech, um, or sorry, not speech, but uh, language translation. Um, and then they're, they're using some kind of algorithm to figure out what color the sign is and mesh in uh, and make it look like it's actually part of uh, the original signage. It's very impressive and it does work. Um, of course, not perfect, but again, if you think about the amount of technology that's gone into this, um, the imperfections are easy to overlook uh, in all of what they've done. And that's today. So um, let's look at near future. Uh, once again, heads up displays. Uh, so Microsoft has a really interesting um, device that's coming to market. Uh, it's available to all developers now at a pretty steep price, but it is available. This is a real thing. It's not vaporware. Um, and the Microsoft HoloLens um, has a unique capability that hasn't really been in other products yet, and that's the ability to sense the physical space around it. Uh, so what makes it unique is it can tell where walls and furniture and floors and all of those things are, and then you can mount virtual things to those surfaces and they will stay put. So if you make a, wall, um, a movie screen on your wall, turn your head, it will stay on the wall. Walk out of the room, it will stay in that room. 
when you come back, it's still where you put it. It doesn't follow your vision around and obscure where you're walking and going. Um, this, this is something that's a bit of a game changer. And there's lots and lots of applications for something like this. Uh, medicine is one of them. Um, industry, education, uh, there's some really cool um, demos that they've shown that are um, kind of like beta ideas of what can be done with this. And one of them is a repair situation where you can instruct somebody uh, through a repair process and using a tablet in a remote location, you can actually draw in 3D space on what that person is seeing. So you're able to augment their vision from a remote location and show them, you know, this screw goes here, this needs to be twisted counterclockwise, and so on. Um, and they're, they're able to see that in their vision. Um, there's actually companies that are looking into using this, and they're pretty far along already, uh, where they're using it for uh, maintenance situations. So the maintenance person can go out to a large piece of equipment, and uh, right now they're, they're experimenting with HoloLens. Some are using iPads, and they hold up their iPad, and the iPad overlays on top of it uh, where certain components need to be pulled out, and uh, like air filters changed and things like that. It shows them the process and everything, eliminating the need for a manual. Uh, they just walk out with an iPad, hold it up, and it's, it animates through, you know, the process of taking out the air filter, putting a new one in, putting the screws back, and so on. Uh, this is an actual app that's in the marketplace. Um, IKEA has virtual showrooms. So, like I said, these uh, devices don't have the ability to, to sense space. Um, so what you do is you print out what is essentially a QR code, place it on the floor, and it uses that to recognize the space. And you can try furniture in your room and see how it looks with other furniture and matching colors and make sure it occupies the right amount of space. But once again, <laughs> we have <clears throat> some human conditions that apply. Uh, looking silly is definitely one of those human conditions. Um, it, it's just weir very weird looking, um, to say the least. Uh, so if that's what's happening in the near future, uh, what is the future of this technology? So I'm going to go off the deep end for a minute. Um, I'll try to reel you back a little bit. So if data is able to do all of these things, um, there is a certain definition of the fourth dimension that says that uh, the fourth dimension is multiple instances of the third dimension that occupy the same space. And it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, that's because we can't see in the fourth dimension. If we were able to see in the fourth dimension, we would need some type of device to help us do that. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that we have this available to us, and it's um, the fact that the data is the fourth dimension, and that augmented reality is the device that we're looking through to experience it, because we can't see it with our own eyes. Um, and the applications that we're using are these different instances of another dimension that exists on top of the one we're in now. So, I mean, it's not really too far-fetched that this is a real thing. Um, uh, I don't know how many people did this, like, just now. That's, that's on the screen, folks. It's not, it's not really here with us. So, for example, Pokemon Go, uh, which wasn't available when I wrote this talk, um, just recently came about and kind of uh, turned the industry on ear, and people started paying attention to augmented reality and uh, finding out it's a real thing and it's marketable and it has uses. Um, a lot of times we use games to uh, find uh, uses for things, and I think this one kind of struck with a lot of people as useful um, for a gaming situation, and now they're trying to apply it to more real-world situations. Uh, but this is an example of what I'm talking about. As I sit here and talk, there could be Pokemon in the room with me. Uh, if you were to load another app uh, or 
want to do something else, if you had glasses on that were augmented in some way, somebody could be watching sports instead of listening to me talk. Um, and that brings up another human condition. Is it over information overload? Are we going to have a difficulty uh, separating these virtual lives with reality? And uh, an example I'd give for that is my wife already isn't happy if I'm texting or emailing in the bedroom. Um, I don't think she's going to be too thrilled with me wearing. You could be in the doghouse very quickly. Uh, joking aside, like just the, the attention um, draw of these things could be enough to annoy people and uh, you know make people angry that you're not paying attention to what they're doing or watching a show that you're supposed to be watching together or these, these n never happen to me. This isn't from personal experience, um, but you get the gist of it. Uh, so some of, there was actually some uh, human conditions that came about with Pokemon Go as well. Um, it became the most popular mobile game in US history like immediately, like this is record breaking stuff. Um, and a lot of positive things came out of that. Uh, it got people outside, it got people interacting with their family, um, it got people somewhat out of their devices and uh, into more of a social uh, structure where they're talking to each other in person and whatnot. Um, and then there were also some not so great things that happened, like people playing in their car and wrecking their car. Um, there's a uh, mechanic in the game called a lure, which brings in Pokemon. Um, the bad part is criminals can put these lures out, and when Pokemon hunters come hunting the Pokemon, they rob them and take their cell phones and wallets. Uh, and then... <laughs> People also notice there's a huge amount of data being collected that they weren't quite aware of when they downloaded and installed the application. So there, again, we see that there's this human condition underlying all of this stuff. Uh, so when we combined all of these things together in the distant future, remember we saw things being you know as big as a room in the 1950s or being very um, infantile in their uh, amount of computing power and the algorithms scaled within 60 years time to be these amazing um, once uh, science fiction things are now reality uh, we, we kind of have this weird future that we need to look at and one of those things is um, it's kind of interesting to me. I, I don't follow Ray Kurzweil very closely, but I've I've seen some of his um, documentaries and things. They're, they're interesting. If if you don't know who I'm talking about, uh, he's the gentleman that talks about the convergence or um, the end all be all is uh, you're uploading your consciousness into a machine. Okay. So uh, he's probably way smarter than I am, but I'm going to take a stab at that and say it's, um, it's one of those things where you're thinking of the future in today's context, not tomorrow's. So here you have a person that is probably not much older than me. Um, I've lived without data collection for many years, so this is a necessity to me if that's what I want. Um, in the future, down 10, 20 years, when a baby is born, they may have had data collected on them prior to birth, let alone after. So they're constantly inputting data into a system through Facebook, Twitter, things that haven't been invented yet, sensors that haven't been released yet, um, IoT wearables, data just tons of data collected on a person for their entire lifetime from birth. Um, do you need to upload? into something, it's already there. It's already there, you've already collected it for forever. Uh, what are we uploading exactly? Uh, with machine learning, you can make predictions based on that life history of data. Everything I've liked on Facebook, every picture of food I took, you know everything I eat, I love, I dislike, 
person I've, uh, I've supported uh, for politicians, you name it, it's going to be in there and you could use machine learning to predict what I would like even when I'm not around anymore. So you could use one's past history to predict what their likes, dislikes, favorite foods would be without them being in existence. So it, that's really creepy. Um, you know, some people don't like topics like that being even discussed. It kind of makes their skin crawl or makes them want to lash out at technology. Uh, it could be a real thing. I mean, this is, you've seen 60 years of computing history. What are the next 60 years going to look like? And it could be, uh, it could be virtual consciousness. Um, that, that could really make people edgy that uh, we're not so good at dealing with stuff like that. So does that bring us into the twilight zone? So let's do, let's do an alternate ending. That's kind of a creepy note to end the conference with. <laughs> so let, let's try to make this a little more palatable. Um, the choice is really ours, right? So we can use technology to, to do great things, uh, like Jon Snow did. So hopefully we use all this stuff to solve real problems and help people and do great things. And any questions, comments? Who's creeped out? <laughs> I think um, you, you made the point like that how's it going to impact people who are you know you're distracted and then you know, get people at the table they're on their phones and stuff. I think that we're just kind of evolved in a society that was in the norm. And yeah, you see that with the younger kids. Yeah, I don't have the same sense of privacy that we have. Some of this big data stuff freaks me out. And the sun is the way it is. It's the way it is. It's how he grew up. He's used to it. And he doesn't really care. Yeah, it's the act of getting over that hurdle that is the struggle, right? That's like the, the part where you have to like accept it is the hard part. Only we will have to do that because the other one's already out. Right. But I think physiology. Physiologically and how we just evolved as a people and society, right? It's really interesting to see where that goes. Right? So, yeah, that was awesome talk. Thank you. Okay. Glad you guys enjoyed it. If uh, you visit the talk online, it's up on SlideShare. I can tweet out some links later. There are actual articles behind all of the points I made. I did a lot of reading to, to make this uh, so it wasn't just um, my opinion, but rather based on my opinion based on real things. Uh, and this list grows daily because there's just so much happening so fast. And um, it's, it's really hard to keep up with. Like, Trying to trying to explain Pokemon Go to people before Pokemon Go existed <laughs> is difficult enough. Um, but then when it yeah, but when it comes about, like you know, people are like, how do we how do we make the next Pokemon Go happen? Well, I don't have the answer, but it's in this somewhere. Like, hopefully somebody finds it and remembers me. Like. <laughs> Thank you all. I just want the hover car converter. Why can't I? That's all I'm saying. If I had that, I can get over my big data problem. <laughs>